I think of, of mortgages as kind of like three categories, maybe even four. The first one is your traditional bank. So you go into a, a local bank, a Mountain America Credit Union. Okay. They're a bank. They do everything. They're a traditional bank. They're not exactly what I think of as a mortgage banker, but they do, they do originate, process, underwrite, and fund their own loans. Okay. They don't typically carry that long-term loan, though. They're going to sell that loan to a bigger servicer, such as a Wells Fargo or a Chase or a Penny Mac or something. Okay. They're not typically holding a large servicing portfolio. They still underwrite it, though, and they still fund it with their money. So most people think they go to the bank and the bank's got it all figured out and I bank with them. And so they've got all my stuff, but the honest truth is your loan's going to end up at X, Y, Z service or anyway, and they have to cross and check everything off. So the fact that you bank with that bank has nothing to do with your loan file. Okay. It's two totally separate things. Okay. Then you've got, uh, the complete opposite in the spectrum of that is a broker. So a broker means you own your own little shop mm-hmm. and there's, and you, originate and typically process locally, but then you send the loan off to a corporate giant. Uh, one of the biggest wholesalers. So, so brokers send loans to wholesale companies. The biggest wholesaler is uh, United Wholesale Mortgage. Okay. So you basically take your loan file, you meet with the borrower, you take your application, package it up, make it pretty, and you send it off to them to underwrite, fund it, record on it and all those things. And you can have many of many companies that basically you're appointed with. Mm-hmm. The cool thing about that is you can kind of do your own thing. The negative to that, I used to be a broker. I think it works in a certain size business model, um, but you're, you don't have any control over that company that you're sending the loan to. It's hard to build a really good relationship because you're kind of dealing with gigantic corporations and you're t- small potatoes to them. Right. Not that you can't be ultra successful. It's just not for me. Well, no matter how big you think you are, you're still some potatoes (laughs) to someone. Yeah. Right. And then there's a a correspondent lender, which is what most of the retail companies are, especially here in St. George. When we think of most of my competitors, okay, um, the Ben McAfee's stuff like that, his company. Shout out Ben McAfee. Yeah. (laughs) Love Ben. Good dude. Great guy. And I'm not knocking anybody. Sure. I'm just saying for me, I like where I'm at. I think you can be successful in all avenues and I don't think everybody's going to like the channel I'm in. Okay. But they fund, they, they process underwrite, fund the loan, sell the servicing. So they function extremely similar to a mountain America credit union in that example. Okay. Okay. But they're probably not servicing the loan. Maybe yes, some, but not all guild is a, a large retail servicer. We service the loan. So we do everything. You will make your payments to us. We're going to report to your credit. Now, if we have a loan that comes in that's unique, that doesn't fit inside of our book, Mm -hmm. I can broker it. So to me, I've got the best of both worlds. The reason I like the servicing, A, I love to keep my client. I love it if they have a tax or insurance problem. I love it if they're trying to remove PMI. I love that if they have a problem with the online website or whatever, that I can actually physically help them. If our servicing gets sold Mm -hmm. and they're at, Penny Mac, I can't help them. Right, right. So for me, that's a really big deal that they stay and okay. they like it. There's not, it doesn't change your loan to get sold. Okay. Sure. So somebody, just so you know, if your loan gets sold, the terms of your loan do not change. Right. It just changes where you make your payment. But if you had to choose, why would you change? Right. So like if somebody fills out my online application, they fill out a login and they've got their online portal where they're uploading bank statements and tax returns to get their loan done. Once we've closed their loan, that's how they log in and make their payment. I just think it's handy. Sure. Um, but then we can broker. So one thing I just pushed out to some of my real estate uh, friends today is that I've closed four really unique bank statement loan programs this year. Okay. So they're, they're geared towards helping that self-employed borrower. Okay. That typically in mortgaging, when you're self-employed, everybody says it's hard to get a loan if you're self-employed. Okay. What it really is, is that we're essentially taking your net business income. So businesses have all these write-offs and deductions, and they try not to claim as much income to the IRS as they can. Mm -hmm. So then when it comes to us as mortgage people, they think they make X amount a month that they've set aside for their lifestyle. We look at their tax return and we go, mortgage lending is only going to give you X minus 50%. Yeah, mortgage lending says you're broke, dude. Yeah. Mortgage lending says you make five grand a month and like I make I I make for sure ten. Yeah. 
So then I could, if I traditionally just do that with tax returns, which is what 99% of all loans do on a self-employed borrower, Mm -hmm. they only make five grand a month. It's not going to get them what they want. Sure. The bank statement program, as long as you have decent credit and typically a larger down payment, this is kind of like a 20% down payment folks. Sure. There'll be advertising out there that says 10 or 15, but the truth is it's a 20% down person. So you got assets, you got the, you got the availability, you've got some decent credit. We can go analyze your personal and business bank statements for the last 12 months, look at deposits, look at expenditures, look at what really the math is over the last 12 month period and not just what was reported to the IRS based on the last tax filing. Okay. The other time that makes sense is let's say that it's uh, August where we've completed seven months of the year and they've had the best seven months of their business. Yeah, business has fundamentally changed, but you're still having an average against two years ago. It, so it's sure. like, it's, it's a very antiquated number. And sometimes businesses have extended. This is one thing that I think is really crazy about mortgage lending on a self-employed borrower. Somebody that extends their tax returns right now. So they can extend their personal tax returns until September 15th. Mm -hmm. So technically the way the mortgage rules are written, a lender can fund a loan and close a loan September 14th of 2024 based on the tax return income of 2022. Mm Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have even had a 2023 tax return. And, and you're already almost done with 2024. We're a year and a half removed from what that business was doing. Yeah. Now they'll get profit and loss statements, but those don't have to be legally analyzed documents. Anybody could throw together anything they wanted on a profit and loss statement sure. and that's going to be it. Yeah. So to me, I think that's absolutely nuts. That's pretty wild. Right. So the, the statement of it's hard to, it's hard to get a loan of self-employed. It really is just because unfortunately we're 99% of the time, we're going to look at your tax returns and it's black and white. Well, I, I think one of the things I've learned is, um, if you are self-employed, they're going to look a lot at your income. It's going to be average. They're going to average the last two tax returns, right? So if you have a, uh, a year where maybe your profitability only came to a hundred dollars on your tax return. And then the next year, you know, you're like, okay, I'm, in, I'm fully in operation and her thing. So, um, made a, a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, it would kind of look like you make 50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Traditionally, that's how it would be on a, on a newer business. Yep. Yep. Um, so sometimes it it takes even till that third year because you got to drop the the hundred off maybe to, to have, you know, um, and then the problem, and this is kind of a good problem to have is if your business is growing really fast and all of a sudden you're like, you're, you're the guy making 300,000 and you're like, yeah. but now you're wanting the lifestyle of 300,000 or the home of, that yeah. would come with yeah. sort of that. Yeah. And the bank's telling you, well, y- you only make 200,000, yeah. you know, cause you got a 300 and a 100. And so now you're like 200. So, um, that's probably okay in that regard. Yeah. It's like, show us you can do it making, two years in a row. Yeah. 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 Um, it starts being easier. Um, but, what I uh, hate to see, yeah. I hate to see businesses. I see, I've, I've seen this my whole it, career is you have these these business owners that they just file their tax returns how they should. They take every possible opportunity to deduct legal deductions and they do a great job with that and they they, yep. they should do that. They, mm-hmm. they should get their taxable income as low as legally possible. Yeah. They come to us mortgage guys and we tell them how much house they can buy based on that and it's not going to cut it. Mm-hmm.